previously on Bullshit Artists. He was an insane person, Dennis K. He and Al hit it off immediately. In 76, they started hanging out an awful lot. Like, I mean, they were, like, joined at the hip. Oh, man, you know what? He did have a thing for him. How come I didn't pick up on that? Well, you know, it was the 70s and I was a teenager. I'd never heard. I didn't even know what a gay was. Al Russo and Dennis Kay were romantically involved. Mm-hmm. As far as I know, they knew each other before the Rotunda Club. Chipmunk Man was on the disco scene, living a disco dream. Cha-cha-cha-cha-cha! Chipmunks! So, let's go back to the bicentennial summer of 1976. A 20-something Dennis K meets 19-year-old Al Russo in the fledgling underground punk scene of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Both men are antisocial, alienated, and exist kind of on the fringe of Baton Rouge society. By all indications, they begin a sexual relationship that ends when Dennis leaves later that year for New York City with the intention of becoming a playwright. The following year in 1977, Al leaves town and follows him up north, finding an apartment directly across the Hudson River from him in Union City, New Jersey. Then, one fateful night at the Rotunda Dance Club in 1977, the two men are reunited, and Dennis tells Al of his intention to submit plays under the pen name Jethro Spivey. Now this is where things get a little fuzzy. What we do know is the first Jethro Spivey play was published in 1979, but we don't know who wrote it or the 21 plays and hundreds of poems that followed it. What we do know is that Dennis and Al both contributed works under the Jethro Spivey moniker over the years. We also know that Dennis leaves Al in 1980 and moves back to Baton Rouge for reasons unknown. After this, the Jethro Spivey output actually increases dramatically. In fact, the decade of the 80s sees an endless barrage of plays and poetry, some critically lauded, some critically panned. Until 1990, when the plays abruptly stop and the poetry trickles away in the year following. Then, Al Russo dies of cancer in 1993. But in 1995, Spivey plays and poetry begin appearing again, although something has fundamentally changed in the tone and style of his poetry. Then, in 2003, Spivey's writing abruptly stops again, only this time, it stops for good. He has not been heard from since. I'm Scott Gordon, and this is Bullshit Artists. My name is Joe Birchfield, and I taught at Robert E. Lee High School from 1968 to 1972. I taught phys ed. We called it gym back then. And I taught shop. And what is shop? Shop, you know, fuck, metal shop. Ain't you ever been to school? You yes. probably went to a city school. Well, we had metal shop. And what kind of things did you make in metal shop? No, we didn't make anything. I just had them drill holes in metal and put screws in them all day. These kids were borderline retards. I didn't have a fucking, they didn't have a lick of sense, and I didn't have a minute left in my day for them. I was just there to get my paycheck. One hour every class for like seven classes. You tell me you wouldn't be tired of teaching these little disrespectful twats. <laughs> well, hey, at least you, at least you loved your job, right? In 72, I had to leave because the school board passed a new rule that you couldn't hit kids in the head with a damn lead pipe anymore. You're serious. Fuck yeah, I did it like a few times a day. One day in 71, when it was Dennis K's class, in fact, I sent the three of them to the hospital with fractured skulls. 
like you do. Oh, man, don't even talk if you weren't there. I mean, these kids were crazy, disrespectful little twats. And I wanted to murder every single one of them with my bare hands. How's that? Is that a good enough of a sound bite for you? That'll work. If you'd seen the way these little... Imagine trying to corral a whole room full of greased weasels. And all of them had little sharp teeth. Dare I say you would be hitting them with a fucking pipe too, my friend. Well... Okay, let's talk about uh, Dennis K, though. Dennis fucking K. Denny K. Little asshole, I think he turned out to be gay. Dennis K the gay, they called him. Well, that's, that's just great. I'm sure that didn't affect his psyche at all growing up. I don't give a shit about his psyche or disposition or any of that fucking new wave fancy crystal rubbing bullshit. They just needed to sit there and be quiet for one hour a day in my class. And Dennis K. just glared at me all day long. And then once in a while, he and I'd get into it. What does that even mean? Get into it. Get into it. You know, I would strike him with a lead pipe. Oh, jeez. Again with the lead pipe? Joe, that's not right. Yeah, well, he was an SOB. They were all little shits. Jeez. Oh, yeah, so we've heard. Um... Do you know if he wound up back in Baton Rouge or where? I don't give a fuck where he wound up. If you see that little shit, tell him Coach B said, eat a dick, DK. Great. Eat it. So, yeah, the interview with Joe Birchfield went dark very quickly, and I ended it. I did manage to find a 1971 Lee High School yearbook. Dennis K.'s photo not available wasn't really a shocker. Here's a guy who managed to avoid human contact his whole life. Not available on Portrait Day. But still a disappointment. He dropped out in 1971, was scheduled to graduate in 73, which by my math puts him about two years older than Al Russo. So I decided to go old school and place a classified ad in the back of the local paper, the Cajun Observer. Just a little blurb about, did anyone know a Dennis K. who lived in the Baton Rouge area in the years 1980 or following? And shockingly, I got a reply from a Mr. Saul Morrow. The next day, Saul agreed to meet me in the local park and tell me what he knew about Dennis K. I knew him because I lived across the hall from him at the Fandango Apartments in Northern Baton Rouge. And he, he wasn't calling himself Dennis K. He entered, well, he, he never introduced himself, but I heard him talking to his boyfriend, I think, as Jethro. That was the name he was using, was Jethro. Yeah, but if he never introduced himself to you. How did you know that his real name was Dennis? I knew his name was Dennis K because I saw his mail, uh, right? Yeah, I saw his mail down by the box. Sometimes it, his mail would come to my unit by mistake and I lived right across the way and I'd just put it down there so he'd see it when he came home. So why did you assume that this other gentleman was his boyfriend, she said? I don't know whether it was his boyfriend or not, but they were kissing in the hallway. Oh. <laughs> it's really the only time, one of the only times I ever saw him. And I had never oh. seen two men kissing before, so I... Oh, oh, dog, 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 dog. The dog. So, as you've probably deduced by now, Saul Morrow is a little scared of dogs. Oh, God. God, I'm still shaking. It'll Look be okay. at my hands, they're shaking. I can't. It's okay, Saul. It'll be all right. No, I'm terrified of dogs. When I was four years old, a dog tried to lick me. It was horrible. 
I'll pull it together. I'll pull it together. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm it's good. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> With the benefit of hindsight, perhaps the local park wasn't the best location to meet Saul in. I had to calm him down quite a bit. He was never really the same after that, but I did manage to get a name out of him, Ed Tinker, who was the landlord of the Fandango Apartments back in the 80s. Now, you may remember Ed Tinker from way back in episode one. He's the guy who produced this mysterious audio cassette from Jethro Spivey's apartment. Hello, and goodbye. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want you to leave a message for me. And I don't need your bullshit. So fuck off. And may all your babies drown in a lake of fire. That is definitely his voice, but unfortunately, you know, I don't have a face to put with it. Which, I know, everyone's told me before, they go, Ed, it's not a good way to run a business. You need to see the people in your apartments. You need to lay eyes on them, at least. But, you know, I mean, Spivey, well, he he wanted to be called Jethro Spivey. I know his mail came under Dennis K., but I didn't know this. He always addressed me as Jethro Spivey, and he always paid in cash. Always paid in cash, sometimes in advance. So, which you couldn't say that for half the people there. They were delinquent, like Mr. Johansson down in the small bungalows. He was always... In fact, I don't think he paid for two full years. Jeez. Why'd you let him stay for two years? Well, he was a veteran, so, you know, I got a soft spot for the veterans. But I took a hit on him, a big fucking hit. I mean, you know. And, you know, Spivey didn't have any kids, so there was none of that. He didn't have any animals to clean up after. And I tell you, Maria down the hall from him had a goddamn menagerie of creepy crawlies. She had them, uh, them big hairy tarantula spiders. Oh my God! When she moved out, she left a few of them up in the. They were up in the attic. What? They fell down on us like fucking Raiders of the Lost Ark. I expected to have a boulder come chase me out of the goddamn apartment. <laughs> and she had these boa constrictors, and they were constantly getting out. I don't know how they wedge out through a window, but they were constantly in the parking lots terrorizing the kids from the neighborhood. Little Jimmy Johnson from up the street had to have, oh, God, I don't like to talk about it because of the lawsuit, but he had to have, we, they had to amputate his foot. What? Yeah, well, I don't know whether you know this, but those boa constrictors, they constrict. <laughs> and, yeah, it was a scene. It was a fucking scene. I don't know about you, but I, for one, am glad I was never a tenant of the Fandango Apartments while they were under the stewardship of Ed Tinker. Now, I eventually got around to asking Ed if he had any idea of where Dennis K. moved after he left in 1986. You know, I thought you might ask that, so guess what I did, Scott? There is no telling. I went back and got my shoeboxes out. And for some dumbass who doesn't know everybody's face and doesn't know how to run a business, <laughs> guess what? You found his info. That's right. I kept all the cards. And I pulled his card for you, as they say in the Navy. I pulled his what? card. And here it is. And he said, this is, the, this, is, this is just like him. Down here where it says forwarding address, he drew a little, a little cartoon hand flipping me the bird. And, but it does say that he wants his mail forwarded to it's he's moved to flagstaff arizona flagstaff yep and hold on drum roll please (laughs) i got the address for you and the name of the person that lives there really Mm Mm-hmm. he moved in with a barbara switzer or switzer yep flagstaff arizona go get him tiger On the next episode of Bullshit Artists. He's living in his mansion, presumably on a high hill, drinking whatever rich people drink. I'd like to think that it's Icelandic vodka filtered through a, some sort of polar bear cave or something. This whole Banksy debacle in the art world is similar to this. Who is he? Where does he come from? Where will he appear again?